Hi everyone, um, welcome to Linux Fest. Um, uh, this is Aaron Gadient and he's going to be presenting on self-protecting containers. Um, thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome. So I'm Austin Gadient. I'm the CTO and co-founder of a company called Valley Cyber. And today I'm going to be presenting to you about something called self-protecting containers. Now before we get into containers, just a little bit about my background and about the company. So I got the idea for Valley Cyber while I was in the U.S. Air Force. I was working at Air Force Research Labs in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I was focused on space and satellite cybersecurity. It turns out the operating system that powers the flight computers that run satellites and the ground systems is Linux. So I was working on defensive Linux security quite a bit. And we tried a bunch of different commercially available solutions and some open source solutions to protect these systems. We ran into a variety of issues. And so that's what motivated me to start a company focused on Linux security. So containers. Containers are ready in the cloud. And if you go back to a 2011 essay by Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz, the famous VC firm, he at the time was talking about how uh, software companies are doing very well, people should invest in software companies. And today, containers are eating software. So Dell did a study in 2022, found out that about 88% of organizations are using containerized software or they're building their own containerized software. And this has led to the development of container image registries that have been commercialized to an extent. So two examples of container image registries, and if you're not familiar with a registry, it's essentially a repository that contains images that get used to run containers at runtime. So two container image registries I'll mention, one would be the Red Hat container image registry, which has both free and paid for container images that you can download and run. And then Iron Bank is another good example of one. So Iron Bank is a Department of Defense container image registry and it allows the government to consume open source software and containerized software in a more secure way because the container images go through various levels of scanning, configuration checks before they can actually be used. And so I would recommend if you're with a small business looking to do business with the government, Iron Bank is a really nice way to do it because if you have a container image in Iron Bank, anybody in the government can just pull it and use it. So it's a very nice way to do some business with the government. So Iron Bank is open, yeah, anyone can get access to it. I think you do need a special login. You have to go through their administrative process to get that, but it should be open to everybody. Okay, so what is a container, especially on Linux? A container is really just a group of processes that have a restricted view of the operating system. This is enabled by a capability called namespaces. So namespaces are uh, of various different varieties. So there are file system namespaces and user namespaces. Essentially what they do is they restrict your access to certain portions of the file system, kind of like a Chirrut jail. You'll have a separate network stack. You'll also have a separate view of the world of the operating system. So you'll only be able to see certain processes from inside a specific running container. And part of the reason they're so popular is because they make it easier to deploy software. So let's say you have a big, beefy Linux server, and on that server, you're running two different applications, an Apache web server and a MySQL database. And Apache needs libssl version 2, MySQL needs libssl version 2.1. This can be kind of a, a pain because you have a collision in the dependencies between the libraries that are required for the two apps. Containers make it very easy to manage this because the container contains the app and the dependencies for the app. Those can be shared on an individual operating system without colliding with each other in any way. So just like operating systems were developed to share hardware resources amongst user space processes, containers are there to share operating system resources, essentially. So aren't containers already secure? There are folks out there that believe just because they're running containers, they have a whole bunch of security built in. And this is actually true to an extent. So those namespaces do prevent attackers from gaining access to the host operating system itself. And the problem is you can do something called a container escape. So container escape will allow an attacker to bypass those namespace restrictions and run commands or run processes on the host operating system itself. So good examples of this would be CVEs like uh, kernel memory corruption issues, buffer overflows, for example, can allow an attacker to bypass the namespace restrictions. There's also a really nice and easy C groups example that we'll use in this actual demonstration where we'll show the use of creating a fake C group that allows us to escape 
from a container. Then you also have to worry about things like supply chain attacks, the XC utils vulnerability was a big deal. A few weeks ago, people were all abuzz about it. And typically supply chain attacks are gonna give you application level access. So you'll get access to a container through a backdoor or vulnerability in the application, not necessarily the operating system itself. However, there are attacks that don't actually require access to the operating system to be successful. And a good example of this would be crypto jacking. So crypto jacking is an attack where the malicious actor is gonna launch a crypto miner on your system and steal CPU resources to mine cryptocurrency, typically Monero, because it's harder to trace. And by default, a lot of container runtimes don't restrict the CPU utilization for an individual container. You can certainly configure them to do that, but def by default, they don't have that restriction. So an attacker can successfully pull out, off something like a crypto jacking attack if they have access to the container. They don't need to do a container escape. So how does one of these attacks work? So in this demo, we have the host operating system on the bottom, and we're going to run a command on that host operating system. That command, let's get this guy to run. So that command is going to be to cat the etsy shadow file. So this is going to give us information about the users on the operating system. So on the top, we are inside of a container on that OS. So we're not actually at the host operating system level. And we're going to prove we're inside that container by catting the proc self mounts directory, which is going to show we're operating in a Docker overlay file system. And now we're going to use that access uh, to run something called escape.sh. Escape.sh is going to run that C groups container escape. It's only five lines of code. And we're just going to run this escape.sh. It's going to run the exact same command that we ran at the bottom. So we're going to cat Etsy shadow. And we were catting the Etsy shadow not inside the container, but on the host operating system. So what this exploit allowed us to do was run a root level command on the host operating system itself. So how does that exploit work? So there are five lines in the exploit. It's pretty straightforward. The first line is focused on getting access to the release agent file. So this release agent file is part of the C groups file system that allows you to define what should happen when a, a C group essentially goes out of commission. There are no more processes in that C group. So the other thing that we're going to do is create a file called notify on release. Notify on release uses a kernel capability that allows us to run a command when that C group exits and there are no more processes in the C group. So the third line is all about getting access to our location on the file system. So remember, we're running in a container. We're not running on the host operating system. And the command that we're going to run is going to be from the host OS's perspective. So it's going to have the host OS's perspective of the file system. So we have to reference it through that long Docker overlay path. So next, we're just going to create our program, which runs the command we want to run. It's going to cat etsy shadow. And then we're going to echo zero into the cgroup.prox file. So this is going to trick the operating system into believing that there are no more processes in the cgroup, which causes the notify on release to trigger, which then allows us to run our command on the host OS. So this is an example of a container escape. This is what we're up against. What are some common approaches to protecting against container attacks and runtime attacks on containers. Does it a question? Yeah, a couple of questions. First, um, is that code available for us to do our own research? Yeah, so I actually got that online. If you just Google container escapes and C groups, okay. it came from Trail of Bits is the organization that wrote up that exploit and it's okay. open online. Maybe I'm getting ahead, but how would an attacker run that code on your container? Yeah, so first they'd have to break into the container through some sort of application layer vulnerabilities in this configuration. Once they're inside the container, they can just create the script. So they just write the data out to the script, scripts inside the container, then they run the script. Now it does require some configuration, uh, specifically about the container. So the container needs some extended privileges to run the exploit successfully. But if that's in place, the attacker can pull this off. Okay, so how do people typically protect containers? Well, the first thing that they do is container image scanning. And this is kind of reminiscent of what happened on desktops and desktop systems where you can think about older technologies like antivirus, McAfee that will scan your file system for malware signatures, malware hashes. 
That's kind of what we're doing with container image scanning. We're going to scan a container image for misconfigurations or for vulnerable libraries or for malware as well. The problem with this approach is it's pretty easy to bypass from the attacker's perspective because all you have to do to bypass a hash-based detection is just change a bit in the file. The hash is different. You can also use things like encrypted, encrypted payloads. The XZ utils vulnerability used an encrypted payload to bypass a lot of scanning checks. So scanning is not perfect. As a result, there's also host-based security. So host-based security is going to run while the container is running. Two really good examples of it would be AppArmor and SE Linux. AppArmor and SE Linux are very, very popular. The problem with them is they're not super easy to use. So a lot of organizations are not able to use them successfully. Some are. You know, the Googles, the Teslas of the world that are very well funded, have very strong technical teams. They use those tools to great success. But other organizations have to rely on more easy to implement security tools that don't require a lot of in-depth knowledge of the operating system. And so examples of these would be EDR or open source security agents like Tracy and like Falco. And so Tracy and Falco are based on something called eBPF or extended Berkeley packet filters. EDR would be like CrowdStrike or Sentinel One. If you're familiar with those security companies, they do endpoint detection and response. Now, the problem with host-based security is that because it's running at runtime, it can have a performance impact or stability impact on your workload. And I've run into DevOps organizations in my time with this company that have manifestos written where they say, we will not run any sort of EDR or preventative technology in our cloud workloads. And they're not doing that because they hate security. They're doing it because in the past they've been burned by these technologies because they ate up a bunch of CPU or they caused some program to crash or something. And if you think about SaaS companies, the cloud and the cloud applications are the bread and butter. So they cannot have any sort of instability whatsoever. And I'd say the last category would be configuration security. So things like uh, cloud security posture management or CSPM. So if you're familiar with the company Wiz, they're a very popular cloud security posture management company. And what they're going to do is scan and check APIs available from a cloud service provider like AWS, like Azure, like GCP. They're going to check for misconfigurations and vulnerabilities in that way. So those are some of the big popular approaches out there. Where do self-protecting containers fit into it? So let's, go ahead. Yeah, just wondering, where does rootless containers fit into, into that approach? Uh, does Hotman and Docker? So, so rootless containers would refer to uh, the container runtime itself. So the daemon that runs the container runtime doesn't have to run as root. So that's a benefit because the, the actual service that spawns containers is at a privileged level in the operating system. And this is just kind of an ideal way to do container containerization in a way that is a little bit more secure because the actual engine that's running the containers isn't running at a privileged level. Right. Um, I'm just wondering why it's not listed as an approach. Like, uh, to me, um, that's something on top of, uh, yeah. If you're looking at SC Linux, why not also you know, rootless containers? No, I think that's a good point. I think certainly a rootless container could be an approach. The other thing that it's worth mentioning would be distroless containers that strip out a lot of tools like Bash that can be used by attackers. So there's certainly some other techniques that I didn't mention that wasn't okay. all encompassing sure. for sure. Got it. Just a follow up question. If the, EBB, the EBPF approach, is that the more native Linux approach to handling the, the uh, host security? So. I guess it really depends. I mean, SC Linux and Apple are definitely native Linux approaches as well. Uh, EBPF is a newer technology that allows you to do kernel level monitoring uh, without actually installing code in the kernel. So you don't need a kernel module to do it. So it's nice in that way that it can be very portable between the different versions of Linux as a result. And it is definitely a native Linux capability. But so is AppArmor, so is SC Linux. Okay, so where do self-protecting containers come into this? So the first thing about self-protecting containers, just to know kind of the idea is you have a container image. The idea is you have some sort of runtime security built into the container image itself. And that runtime security is gonna protect the app that's running inside the container image from various sorts of attacks. So uh, the benefit of that is when you pull a container image from a container image repository, you just get the benefit of having that protection. You don't have to do anything special to configure it or install the protection. It's already there for you. The other nice thing about self-protecting containers is that they work very well with a serverless competing model. So AWS Fargate, GCP serverless, Azure serverless, 
they don't allow you to have access to the host operating system. As a result, you don't get to run things like SE Linux or AppArmor necessarily. So the idea is if you can include the security inside the container image itself, then you still have some runtime security in that specific environment. So how can you self-protect a container? What are some different techniques? Uh, one idea is to use something called FA Notify. So FA Notify is an API built on iNotify. It's a newer version of iNotify. FA Notify and iNotify were out there for antivirus uh, programs to run on Linux systems. They essentially allow you to intercept certain file system events on a Linux system. So if a file gets created, if a file gets deleted, you can see that event, you can decide to allow it or deny it. The challenge with FA Notify in this particular use case is that typically your application sandbox, which is gonna run inside the container with the app it's monitoring, is gonna run at a similar privilege level. So the application sandbox needs to be able to protect itself from a malicious app. And FA Notify doesn't really provide that capability. It relies on the fact that most antivirus is gonna run as root, and perhaps most malware by default is not gonna have privileged access. So we need a technique that's going to allow us to protect the application sandbox itself. And that technique is called SecOp. So SecOp stands for Secure Computing. And what SecOp allows us to do is use an intermediary language called BPF or Berkeley Packet Filters to filter out specific system calls that get executed by the application that we're monitoring. Now, the challenge with SecOp and BPF is that if you're looking at this code right here, this intermediary language BPF is a little bit archaic. It's a little bit hard to understand. A nice thing is that SecOp is used in browsers. In Firefox, for example, Chromium also uses SecOp to sandbox web applications. So as a result, there's a lot of nice open source code out there, some nice pound defines that will allow you to do things like check the system architecture of the process that's running. You can do things like examine the system call that's being used. So there's a lot of nice open source libraries that have been created around SecOp as a result of its use in web browsers. So looking at this model uh, with SecOp, essentially what you do is you can launch an application. When you launch that application from the sandbox, you will install the SecOp filter inside that app. And any process that application creates will inherit that SecOp filter. So it's in there forever for good. Now, there are two different models that you can use with this SecOp-based sort of monitoring. One of them is to use SecOp and Ptrace. And the benefit of this technique is that it goes back all the way to kernel version 3.5. So it's very backwards compatible. The problem with it is it has to use Ptrace. And Ptrace, by default, is not enabled by most container runtimes. So Docker, for example, does not enable Ptrace by default. You'd have to add a special configuration flag onto your container to be able to run it allowing Ptrace. And the reason for that is Ptrace can be used for both good and evil. So it's a debugging API that allows you to do things like control the process, change its register set, change its virtual memory. That can be both very good and very bad depending on how it's used. So this is a, a nice backwards compatible technique. It does have that configuration issue. So there's a nice newer capability that's available in SecOm for kernel 5.0 and greater. There's a question? Yeah, do you know what the performance overhead of having yeah, so the reason you use Ptrace with SecOm is to monitor specific system calls. And the problem with Ptrace as a whole is if you just use Ptrace to do your monitoring, it's going to monitor every single system call. There are over 400 system calls on Linux. A lot of them are not that interesting from a security perspective. Maybe about 20 or 30 are in actually interesting. So with SecOm, you get to choose, I only want to monitor these specific system calls, and that significantly reduces the performance overhead of it. And at the end of the presentation, I'll go over some benchmarking that we did with an application sandbox to kind of show you what that performance impact actually looks like. But it is much, much better to use this technique than to just use Ptrace on its own. Okay, so the next technique is SecOm plus user notification. And this is a kernel 5.0 capability. So anything newer than 5.0 or 5.0 has this. And the idea is instead of needing Ptrace to get notified when a system call of interest occurs, you just have a file descriptor. And so you can read from that file descriptor, you can pull it, and any time there's a system call that gets executed that you want to monitor, you get notified of that system call, and you can choose to allow 
or deny the system call from executing. So this is a really nice way to do sandboxing that doesn't require ptrace, so you don't have to deal with those configuration issues a lot of container runtimes provide. Okay, so what are some different models for a self-protecting container? One of them would be a base image approach. With a base image approach, you actually just have the sandbox itself and a base container image, and then you build off of that image. So you add whatever app you want into that container image, and it's gonna be sandboxed by the application sandbox. The other model is you already put your app into it, you put it in the container image registry, and people just consume that specialized container image in the same way that they would use the original application image. And so they get the benefit of this runtime security without needing to change the way they work. They're just gonna use the app as they would before. And we have done this. So at Valley Cyber, we have two self-protecting container images in the Red Hat container image registry. One of them is for Apache HTTPD. So this is an example of an application that has a sandbox built into it. And there's also the base image approach. So the Red Hat 8 universal base image is another example of an image that has the application sandbox inside of it. And you could build off of it or add whatever app you want to on top of it. And these are free to use and open. So you can go download them from the Red Hat registry. You just need a Red Hat login. The Apache HTTPD example does require an IBM issued token. So you just have to email IBM support. They'll give it to you. It's also free to use. Uh, that you just have to go through that extra hoop to get that token to be able to download it. So let's see what an application sandbox can do for you in practice. So we're gonna go through four different demos. And this first demo is an example of using uh, an attack where we're gonna try to add a foreign executable into the container image and then try to run that foreign executable. So you can see at the top, we're running our self-protecting container image. And at the bottom, we have copied in defray 777, which is a ransomware executable for Linux. And we're going to try to run that ransomware to encrypt the var directory. And you can see that we've listed out the files right there. We're gonna to try to run this ransomware, encrypt the var directory, and that isn't possible. So what the application sandbox is doing is it's looking at the list of applications that are in the, the container image by default and it has hashes of them. And so if there's a new program that executes that has a new hash, then you're gonna prevent that executable from running. And so that's what stopped this particular attack. So the problem with just going by executables is that there are different ways to bypass this approach. And one of them is a fileless malware attack. So in a fileless malware attack, we're not actually going to add a new executable into the system. So this time, what we're gonna do is try to encrypt this local mount directory, and we're going to use a combination of programs, OpenSSL to do the encryption, and RM to do the deletion. And these are programs that were already present in the container image. So we didn't add anything new to the container image to pull off this attack. So what we're gonna do is list out all the files in the local mount directory with the grep command. We're gonna use OpenSSL to encrypt the individual files, and RM to delete them. And the files that we're going after are just a collection of about 100 different text files. And we'll see those here. They just all have a little bit of text in them. Valley Cyber Zero Lock SPC. So now we'll go back and we'll try to run this ransomware attack. And when we do that, it'll run for a little bit and then it gets killed eventually. And so what the sandbox is doing in this case is it's looking at the file system access patterns of applications within the container. And as files are being modified and deleted and created, it's going to check, okay, a new file was created, and what is the entropy of this new file? So it's looking at things like file entropies and files that are being created, files that are being deleted, to determine in a behavioral manner whether ransomware is executing inside the container image. So the other thing that we've just shown, and actually I'll, I'll jump back a little bit to show that again. So the SPC has an API. And you can see some files have been encrypted. That 44.txt file has been encrypted right there. And we're gonna use the application sandbox's API to roll back the file system image to what it was 
previous to the attack. So those encrypted files that were encrypted during the ransomware attack have been restored. You can see that 44.txt file now has the original data inside of it. It's no longer encrypted. And the way we're doing that is we're looking at what the file system looks like before the attack occurs and looking at it after the attack occurs, and then we can roll back the attack. And because we're doing behavioral detection, you have to allow the bad behavior to exhibit itself a little bit. So you have to allow some files to be encrypted before you can actually do an effective detection without a whole bunch of false positives. All right, demo number three is a container escape. So this is that same container escape we saw earlier in the presentation. So we're just going to run our self-protecting container image. We're going to run this escape.sh program once again. And you might be able to guess what's going to happen when we run this escape.sh program. We're not able to create this file that was critical in that container escape. And our session was killed once again. So how did that get stopped? Similar to SE Linux and AppArmor, this application sandbox has mandatory access capability mandatory access control capabilities within it. So these are what we call lockdown rules. The lockdown rules allow you to define what programs another program is allowed to execute, what files it's allowed to access, and what network resources it's allowed to access as well. And they're written in JSON. You're able to write them yourselves. We have a support portal we, you can read about how to create them. And the sandbox also comes with some of these rules out of the box. So what this particular rule is doing is it's monitoring file system access and it sees this release agent file being created, which was one of the files that had to be created for the container escape. When it sees that, it kills the offending group of processes and prevents that file from being created. So the container escape is impossible. And with the last demo, we're going to go back to what I was talking about with FA Notify, where the self-protecting container has to be able to protect itself from a malicious app. So that sandbox has to protect itself from a malicious application. And the way we're going to do this is by intercepting specific system calls which could be used to damage the sandbox. In this case, the kill system call. So we're going to try to kill the zero lock application sandbox with the pkill command. And you can see that's not possible. We weren't able to kill it. In fact, our session within the container was kicked out because that group of processes was killed. Now. Performance is very important with security. We were talking about that just a little bit earlier. What is the performance impact of using this technique? So we used a tool called Security Perf. Security Perf is an open source tool. It's available on GitHub. And essentially what it does is it will run an application under a benchmarking suite. So it'll do things like benchmark a specific database or benchmark a specific web server. And it will measure how many transactions per second it was able to accumulate over a certain amount of time. So the idea is you run this benchmark both with and without a security tool in place, then you can measure the difference. And we ran this for 100 iterations. We took the average. The impact of the sandbox was about 1.17%. The test was run on two AWS EC2 instances with four gigs of RAM and two virtual CPUs. So the SPC is used about 42 megabytes of disk space larger than the original container. Now that rollback capability that I was talking about, it does use extra file space as well. So depending on the workload and how large files are within the system, that might add some file overhead as well. But you can also restrict that capability uh, based on the size of the files that you want to allow to do a rollback on or the size of the cache itself that's used to do the rollback. And then lastly, uh, you have RAM utilization. So it uses on average about 50 megs of RAM. The sandbox only uses about 50 megs of RAM. So generally speaking, it's pretty lightweight and available for most operating systems. Um, as far as contributions go, we've created two different self-protecting containers. One of them is a base image model for the Red Hat Universal Base Image. The other one is an application model with Apache. Those are available on the Red Hat Container Image Registry. They're going to protect those containers from various sorts of attacks like ransomware, cryptojacking, supply chain attacks, so on and so forth. And again, they have a minimal performance impact. So only about 42 megs of disk and 50 megs of memory. And we saw the performance impact of a specific app. So very low impact, at least on a web server application. So with that, are there any additional questions? 
Um, can you tell more about how you hash the program that's running? Like what part of the process do you hash? So we hash the, uh, the executable that's being used to run the application. So when you do an exec the e system call, you're going to reference some mm -hmm. executable on the system, and that's what's being hashed. And the, the initial state of the system is based on when the image is created, you hash on the right? Exactly. That's right. And for the files, how do you roll back files? Like, do you, do you record modification states? Um, how, do you, how does the rollback work? Do you snapshot the entire file? Yeah. yeah, so we snapshot the entire file. As files are being accessed, let's say a file <laughs> is about to be deleted or written to, we'll basically make a copy of that file. And there is an optimization in there. Uh, if you're just going to unlink a file, mm -hmm. instead of actually backing up all the data, we're just going to keep that inode around for a little bit longer. So there's some optimizations to improve the performance a little bit. Seems yes, sir. Like, <clears throat> seems like this, you know, this is, thanks for everyone sharing for this, because it seems like there's a lot of different um, techniques and tools and approaches which are available now. Whereas maybe, uh, I don't know, like 10 years ago, five years ago, it was more of a, an academic approach. It was more, how do I re, um, reduce my surface area to avoid any of the attacks? So there was like techniques in terms of even using special, uh, special versions of Java and other languages that had the, um, the ability to instantiate or, or, or they, they, they basically removed permissions so that they ran, the, the language itself ran with like a very tight uh, capability of what the language could do. So uh -huh. that seems like it started there. And that's kind of, little, it's okay for Google, but it's like, it's academic. You've got to be like sort of like a super, have it like super knowledge in order to operate at that level. But now there's like these techniques that you can use and you can put into production without having that sort of level of, of understanding of CS. Yeah, yeah, no, that's absolutely right. So, for example, with AppArmor and SE Linux, those are technologies that are a little bit harder to understand, but the Googles of the world can certainly do it. Um, I think a lot of older host-based and runtime security for Linux was based on kernel modules, but development of technologies like eBPF and SecComp make it a lot easier to do runtime security in a way that's portable between different versions of Linux. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. <laughs>